Hello and welcome to this very special addendum to Tolkien Day, discussing Tolkien and his relationship with history. I am very lucky to be joined by the esteemed Professor of Medieval History, Rachel Fulton Brown, who is also a Tolkien scholar. Hello. Hello, thank you for having me. And thank you for scheduling a special with me because I couldn't do Monday. <laughs> No, that, that that's absolutely fine, even though it's um, slightly belated. You're our, um, uh, in addition to my wonderful other guests, a, a celebrity cameo, so to speak, within um, talking circles. So I'm very happy to have you on. Now, I've um, already had a conversation or a series of conversations on this channel relating to, uh, you can say, the cauldron of story regarding the mythological, the scripture and the historical inspirations for Tolkien in the Third Age specifically, uh, with my collaborator on Tolkien Day, Nathan Hood. So I was wondering for this stream, because obviously we've gone over various aspects, you know, poetry, um, Tolkien's relationship with the English literature establishment, uh, whether we could um, try and elucidate some of Tolkien's thoughts on the subject of history and gleam any sort of broader, you know, inspirations for the legendarium. Uh, so first of all, do you have any sort of introductory remarks you want to make about Tolkien's relationship with the subject of history? Well, I have um, some questions since this is coming on the, the you know, after several other discussions you've had. Just uh, also to double check, is my sound okay? Because I, I you break up a little bit and we had that internet problem getting started. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Okay, okay, great. Um, so I, w when you've talked about history, have you talked about um, the notion called papers and asterisk history and the toss up with Lewis on space and time and, and that sort of thing? Because that's that's one of the things that I think is really important to understand how Tolkien theorized his stories. Has that been part of your conversation yet? Uh, not so far. So would you like to um, introduce us to this? Okay, that's excellent. All right. So, um, setting up with history, I mean, one of the things that um, people always want to know is like, you know, to to what extent is Tolkien writing, uh, you know, something that's a, a world building, right? They're always talking about him saying, you know, they if they're modeling their own writing on Tolkien. They want to to participate in world building, making it sound like they're making up the world from scratch. Right. And it, mm. it's interesting that people think that that's copying Tolkien because that's exactly what he didn't do, at least in his own understanding of how he came to the history of what he called Middle Earth. And um, again, I'm, I'm just I'm just a little self-conscious of sort of stepping in the middle of, of, of all the sorts of conversations you've had, including stepping into the middle of describing what Middle Earth means. Right. And that Middle Earth, um, as, as I hope, you know, is, is that the. the it's the old English, middle English term simply for our, as Tolkien would put it, our habitation, right? It's, it's mm. in fact, our earth, right? Mm. So when he said his stories in what he called Middle Earth, he meant it to be, in fact, our own landscape, right? And when I teach, when I teach my course um, at Chicago and Tolkien, or if you have seen some of my unauthorized videos, we, we talked about this, um, if you can, you can try mapping Tolkien's landscape onto basically Europe, right? And there's one of, in one of his letters, he has um, a discussion of saying, well, you know, Oxford is probably at the, uh, say the Shire is probably at the latitude of Oxford or whatever. And um, Gondor is, is down there probably at the latitude of, I don't know, Constantinople or Rome or something yeah. like that. So, so there is, there, there's a, a sort of climate mapping obviously in the story, but there's, there's also, very significantly a conceptual mapping. And the the sort of hook to all of that is to realize that what Tolkien thought he was doing was writing a time travel story, right? <laughs> he, he's not in fact writing a made up world, a fantasy world. He's actually throughout his legendarium writing what he thought of as history. And mm -hmm. um, the best the best place to go for his theorizing about what he was doing was was the Notion Club papers, which is in um, it's in Sauron Defeated, so it's in the History of Middle Earth, Volume Nine. Yeah. And are are you familiar with that? The setup in in the Notion Club papers. It's it's a wonderful sort of fiction of Tolkien and his you know in, uh, fellow Inklings having one of their conversations, 
fictionalized about what it would be like to write a yeah. time travel story, right? Yeah. Um, and and in that conversation, there's there's some um, very interesting sort of nods to the the kind of theoretical framework that Tolkien was working with. Um, it's like, how do you, how would you, well, how would you write a time travel story? What kind of mechanism would you use um, to get your character back in time? And um, and comparing it explicitly in the conversation with the kind of space travel story that Lewis was writing, right? So let me know whether this is where you, you want to, we can, we can go with this, right? No, this is fantastic. Please continue. Okay. <laughs> You're just going to let me lecture. Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> I will give the lecture that I, that I also can do. Um, so to, 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 <laughs> to, un to understand, and I'll do it the way I do it on, on um, my Forge of Tolkien on Unauthorized, which is, you know, throw books at you and say, here's the passage that you need to be thinking about. Um, so the first thing comes in um, Tolkien's On Fairy Stories, right, where he is, you know, in, in that famous essay where he's describing what it means to create a, a, a secondary reality um, that yeah. you, know, you can enter into and participate in. And there's this 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 wonderful um, moment at the end where he's talking about Christianity, which I know is one of your themes, <laughs> um, and and how, in fact, the Gospels are the fairy story, right? That it's not just that they're a kind of fairy story, but they are in fact, um, a, he says, a story of a larger kind, which embraces the essence, all the essence of fairy stories. Yeah. And, and and the reason that it embraces all the essence of fairy stories is because he says, this story, the gospel, right? So our Christian story, our reality, our, our you know, incarnate experience, this story has entered history. And there's a capital H history, right? Um, and the primary world, the desire and aspiration of subcreation has been raised to the fulfillment of creation. The birth of Christ is the eucatastrophe of man's history. Uh, the eucatastrophe being the the sort of happy turn, the joyous turn from sorrow to 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 grace, right? That that he describes as characteristic of fairy stories. So that his his first his first and primary claim about history is there is this fairy story that's entered into history and in this fairy story he says um it's it's the the one that people most want to believe have be understand as true right um he says it this story is supreme and it is true the gospel art has been verified god is the lord of angels and of men and of elves legend and history have met and fused, and it's that last that last phrase that I th I think is really important here. This legend and history have met and fused. What on earth does he mean by that, right? And that's where the Notion Club papers become very important because the characters in that um, fiction, right? And I, maybe I should set up that a little bit more clearly for your for your audience. Um, are talking explicitly about the relationship between myth and history, right? And and the the sort of what happens if you travel back in time? Do you get just more history, or do you get something else? Do you get this this sort of mists of time kind of experience, right? So that that's where that's what we're trying to understand: what how this legend and history can have met and fused, and why therefore the whole legendarium that he's he's writing is actually taking place in our. Middle Earth, right in our in mm. our own habitation, right? Yeah. I I do I <laughs> it's like I recognize that this is not my lecture, right? So please ask questions if you, if no, you no, want me no, to. No, no, no. It's stop. interesting. I think I think uh, I think <laughs> if um no no I think um can monologue uh, often, with the best often, of them. I, I was like, <laughs> go ahead. Often, often in this case, I've I've also had um uh, Charles Coulomb on here both to talk about um. Uh, history in regards to um, Blessed Charles, but also um, on for Talking Day. And um, invariably, you know, when I have a guest on, I do tend to lecture. I do tend to overwhelm with um, you know, bamboozle information with a script. But I thought um, precisely why I wanted to have you on in particular is because I've almost presented my own rendition of not the overarching philosophy of history, um, but in particular, some various aspects. So, for example, I've gone into the um, 
uh, the, the story of creation. I talked about um, mm -hmm. the various historical inspirations for Rohan in particular. I've um, discussed the works of Tom Shippey. Uh, I've discussed the various um, historical allusions to Gondor. I've discussed the notion of kingship, for example. So when we're talking about the Notion Club pa um, uh, papers and this conception of essentially the work of Lord of the Rings as a almost, you know, a, a work of time travel. Um, this is, again, something which I'm only sort of very faintly familiar with. And whilst I, you know, <laughs> wouldn't claim any sort of particular expertise in this part, I'm more than willing uh, to let you, you know, um, elaborate for us. Because again, in this, in the scheme of things, you are very much the expert and I am the, um, I am the listener. <laughs> okay. Well, actually that helps me though. So you've been talking about the sort of particular, um, cultures and languages and settings that inspire specific elements in Tolkien stories. What I'm trying to point to is this sort of larger conceptualization of how do we connect with that story, which is, is one mm. of the things that Tolkien was always very interested in. He, he has this problem of framing, right? So the Notion Club papers, the, the delightful thing about the Notion Club papers, one, they exist only in draft, right? And it's, it's one of those things that um, Christopher, when we're talking about Tolkien, we're now sort of talking about Tolkien father and son constantly, yeah. right? Because Christopher gave us so much of the, the working materials that he gives us the the potential to theorize behind the stories, right? Because he's, he's you know, editing all of his father's papers and giving us all of this. But the Notion Club papers, it's not an old draft or redrafting of the Lord of the Rings or the Silmarillion or anything like that. It's, it's, as I said, it's this, this sort of fictionalized meeting of the Inklings renamed as all different characters, right? So it's, it's actually a little tricky to figure out which ones are which because mm. all of them are a little bit Tolkien, right? There's this John Jethro Rashbold is one of the figures born 1965, which I love because that's, mm. that's when I was born, but Rashbold, is a pun on Tolkien, right? That's actually yeah. what the name means, Tolkien, right? Um, but they're also, there's also a character, um, Raymer, who's the philologist, um, uh, Ari, Alwyn Arundel Loudum, um, who's um, um, chiefly interested in Anglo-Saxon Icelandic and comparative philology. It's it's like the, and there's like a dozen characters or so, the, these Notion Club paper characters are meant to model the way in which Lewis and Tolkien and Hugo Dyson and, you know, Owen, Bar um, Owen Barfield and, and his, their other friends got together and, and brainstormed their, their creative projects, right? Brainstormed their, their, their conversations. But in a way, all of the Notion Club papers are obviously Tolkien talking to himself yeah. about how he, as a philologist, a, you know, a, there's, um, you know, Professor Finno, a Geritic philology. There's a professor of psychoanalysis and gardening. That's a Rupert Dolbear. He's asleep a lot in the first in the opening. <laughs> um, there's <laughs> there's Wilfred Trewin Jeremy, who's a university lecturer in English literature and so forth. So it's it's like Tolkien is has broken himself down into these different voices to imagine the problem that he's given himself of how would you write, in fact, a time travel story. But there's other there's other sort of tricks and jokes in the whole point of the Notion Club papers. They are, according to the editor, within the fiction, right? Um, that they're discovered um, after the summer examinations of 2012, <laughs> right? So they're projected into the future and then backwards again. It's kind of fun on the top of one of a number of stacks of waste paper in the basement of the examination schools at Oxford by the present editor, Mr. Howard Green, the clerk of the schools. And so Green sets you up to claim, I found these papers, these notes in 2012. There's a date, and, and then he supposedly edits them and publishes them in 2014. Um, there's the, the meetings that are taking place in this, these minutes are supposedly taking place in the 1980s, hmm. which is funny, right? But the paper seems to come from earlier than that, <laughs> right? So you know, it, it's like the the jokes that Tolkien put in Farmer Giles of Ham, where he has, yeah. you know, the it's a lecture that he gave. And it, in fact, it's a story. But in fact, the story is actually about figuring out what the place named Thames means, right? Because it's the tame dragon, right? So hmm. there's this scholarly joke of we as medievalists will look at the manuscript, we'll look at the handwriting, we'll look at the dates on the, on the papers, we'll look at when, you know, it was actually edited. And he, as 
setting this all up for you potentially as as the reader is framing the it, just the entry into these minutes of this conversation that they're about to have about what history is. <laughs> Yeah. And, and 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 that is that that's you know the first level of understanding what Tolkien was as a as a writer is that he you know it, it's interesting looking at his scholarly output because it's not great compared to his notes on, on his legendarium right he 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 everyone knows he was a philologist he was you know concerned with history of languages um, he did editing work right he um, worked on the edition of the Ankara Visa which is a a handbook for anchoresses living yep, in yep. The, the religious 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 life. Um, he did the the um, work on Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. He has the translation of Pearl and so forth. He's always in his own scholarship thinking through the layers of how do we come to this text. Right, you have to think about what the language is for the Ankara Visa. You have to think about the uh, manuscript history of how we get these texts. And in his own fiction writing he's adding those frames too, right? If you, if you know, like in the, in the Lord of the Rings, there's um, the, uh, in the, the frame on the title page, right? There's the, the um, runes and the Tengwar. And it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's actually in English, but it's a joke about how this is the book that Bilbo and Frodo wrote, right? Yeah. The Downfall of the Lord of the Rings. So, yeah you're always coming to Tolkien with his self-awareness of our need for entry into the story somehow, right? That there, there's a frame and you're worrying about that. And, and, and that's what his characters in the Notion Club papers are actually talking about. And the first thing they talk about is the kinds of frames that they really dislike, right? That they, um, that there's, they're saying, um, they're specifically talking about the space travel story, which I've alluded to. So everyone knows Lewis writes the space trilogy, right? The Out of the Silent Planet, Pure Landra, and, and um, That Hideous Strength. And that um, Tolkien, in his letters, explains that, you know, he and Lewis were having these conversations about how nobody seemed to write the kinds of stories we like to read. So I guess we'll have to write our own. And we did a toss up and Lewis was going to do space travel and I was going to do time travel. Hmm. Uh, and and that's why you know he's and they talk about it. They talk about both of their projects as science fiction, right? It's it's science fiction that they're both writing. So the Lord of the Rings, you think it's fantasy? It's actually science fiction <laughs> in in this sort of high level of theorizing. How do we get to how do we how do we create a believable entry, right? And yeah. in the in the Notion Club papers, the first thing they're talking about is how. Um, in um, space travel, right? It's it's deadly if the mechanism that the author uses to get the characters into the story is too clunky, right? Um, and there's a the, I, I think it's sort of funny because in Out of the Silent Planet, right? The mechanism is that you know crystal bullet basically. <laughs> oh, put put Raymer in a coffin and shoot him into the stars, and oh look, now he you know understands the the, the celestial harmonies and so forth, and so there's a little ribbing at like what kinds of conversations they must have had as the inklings about does this work as a device mm -hmm. to convince your reader that it's true, right? That how do you yeah. get them into that secondary, secondary reality? And they, and they talk about the problem of the frame, right? Um, he, he says, um, you know, Raymer says something like, it's just like you, Nicholas, to pick on the frame, which is an awkward necessity of pictures and easy to change anyway and say nothing about what's inside it. And they say, well, no, um, you, you don't get away with the excuse that the picture frame is, is, you know, just a device, right? It has to have a sense of reality. Otherwise, the, st the story won't work. The story is, is yeah. going to break, right? Remember, all along this, we're trying to figure out how legend and history meet and fuse, <laughs> and 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 the the device, interestingly, that Tolkien came to, and Lewis and some of the others were also playing with this, was dreams, right? And there's a there's a whole other sub lecture in this if you pay attention to the um, the places in the Lord of the Rings where the characters have dreams, right? For example, when the hobbits are in the house of Tom Bombadil. And Frodo has the dream of Gandalf at Orthanc, yeah. right? Yeah. You can see him. 
And one of the one of you know the fascinating and lovely things about reading the Lord of the Rings is you you know then they have to figure out exactly what day it was, right? When exactly was the dream? You know, is it in the future? Is it in the past? You know, when you you realize that Frodo is like he's he's seen at a distance, but he's also seen in time, and. Tolkien mapped all of that out really carefully. It's, he loved chronologies. You have all those, you know, lists of dates mm. and and um, events and things in the in the appendices and in the history of Middle Earth. There's all those other annals, right? More and more lists and lists and dates. He's constantly like correlating, you know, what happens exactly at what time and and yeah. and so he, nothing that he did was like accidentally accidental chronologically. Um, and and the dreams, for you know, it's like there's. For example, Frodo's dream of Gandalf at Orthanc, or um, the, the the sensation that the characters have in the Fellowship when they go into Lorien and lose track of time, and then when they're leaving, they feel like they've been in a in a dream. Right? It's like attend to, attune yourself to the number of times that the characters talk about are they in a dream or are they in reality? And at the very end of the Hobbit's journey, when they come back to the Shire. Um, there's a little conversation between Frodo and, and Mary and um, now I can't remember which way it goes. It's like one of them says, I feel like we've been in a dream and, and, and we're waking up. And the other one says, no, I feel like we've just fallen asleep. This is a clue to the actual like technical device that Tolkien thought he was going to use in creating his time travel story. And what's interesting about it is that there was, believed to be in the in the time that they were having these conversations, the inklings, an actual scientific basis for this kind of time travel mm. in dreams. <laughs> that, that, that is interesting. Would you like to expound upon that slightly? Oh yes, of course. <laughs> so this this I get from Verlin Flieger, um, a question of time. She go she went she goes beautifully into how Tolkien and Lewis draw on this, this philosophizing about time travel. And the, the source that they use is a book um, by J.W. Dunn that was called An Experiment in Time. Mm. And Dunn, he, he, you know, he has claimed to fame as he, like an aeronautical engineer and such, but he, he tried to do this scientific record of dreams that he had because he started having this, this sense that he was dreaming things that then happened, right? And he, you know, does it anecdotally and he collects a lot of stories and stuff, but then he tried to explain a kind of mechanism for the widening of attention that if you could just widen your attention properly, you could, you could kind of find yourself, it, it, they're all reading, you know, relativity stuff and everything in the period too. It's the twenties and thirties. And, and Dunn has this idea that it, you could actually time travel by training yourself in dreams to widen the, your frame of reference. Yeah. Right. And what the characters in the Notion Club papers do is test this. Right? Uh, they they talk about it, and they're they're you know at one point, um, well for okay, so for example, they're they're talking about things like you need to have the right machine to set the tone for the the device that you want to do and such. And so you know having the dream characters, um, the dream travel actually work really mattered because Tolkien didn't want it. To, he didn't want to feel like these stories were made up. He wanted to feel like it went, he wanted the Lord of the Rings and everything else to feel like you'd simply traveled in time by way of, well, how, right? This, this widening of attention and that you could train yourself to do it. Right. And in, in the, in the notion of papers, he has, um, Raymer explain, you know, how he, he does this sort of dream travel by like attaching, there's a meteor, a meteorite in the park. And he goes and he like talk, I mean, it's like talk, he doesn't really talk. He, it, he attends so fo in such a focused way to the meteor that he's able to go on these space journeys by tapping into the meteor's memories somehow. Mm. Right? Um, so he, no, I mean, it gets, you think, you you think you've got you you figured out Tolkien, uh, and and then you realize he's 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 trying to play with this the sci-fi stuff even more generally, right? So, um, he you know he's describing Raymer's describing one of these dreams that he's been training himself in and saying, you know, um, that he 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 seems to be able to travel to other places, 
for example, he gets to this one called Tekel Miram. Um, says, I don't know why I visited this strange scene for awake. I've never studied crystallography, not even though the vision of Tekel Miram has often suggested that I should. Whether things go in Tekel Miram exactly as they do here, I cannot say. All the same, I wonder still, what on earth or in the universe? Excuse me. You should ask me more questions. <laughs> Can be meant by saying, as was said a hundred years ago by Huxley, I believe, that a crystal is a symmetrical solid shape assumed spontaneously by lifeless matter. The free will of the lifeless is a dark saying. But da -da -da. I merely record or try to record the events I saw, and they were too marvelous while I could see them in far off Tekel Miram for speculation. Right. So he's he's you know he's managed by way of sitting himself beside this meteor to travel into space and to find all these crystalline objects, and and then at in sort of concluding scene he has this experience where he's he's kind of zooming back in, right? It's it's very cinematic, right? He's zooming back mm -hmm. in and he's looking and looking and he he says um, he sees that um, he's in a location where there's. Uh, it's something that he thought was a quick growing fungus until I looked more steadily, but now I saw they were buildings, but still fungus buildings appearing and then falling to pieces. And yet their agglomeration was spreading. I was still rather high above it all, higher than a man in a very tall tower. I could see the place was crawling or rather boiling with now of some sort. Da, 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 da. And he's like, this is really frightful. What it is, what is it, what is it, what is it? And then he realizes he's looking at the Radcliffe camera and he's looking yeah. at Oxford. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's, Tolkien wanted you by way of this dream travel and the time travel, which we're still working on, to feel like you were actually, it's all one universe, right? There's there's one creation that all of this is happening in. And it's to a certain extent changing change of perspective and, and attention, but it's not it's not another universe or world or world made up. It's Middle Earth that all of this is going to be tied to. So let me understand it. So all of this is tied to Middle Earth, and this is a means of approaching Middle Earth or trying to access it. So right. in that way, how essentially did Tolkien conceive of Middle Earth? Did he conceive it as a particular time and space somewhere in a particular era? Um, or was it, in a sense, a primordial era which um, uh, predated all of known history, so to speak? So. This is where his, uh, you said you'd read Shippy, right? And and yeah. Shippy has that wonderful um, discussion of asterisk history, hmm. right? Where um, as the philologist, when you're studying a language, you have, you know, record in writing, if you have writing, writing is tricky here. Um, you have um, evidence of particular forms of words, right? And yep. then um, as, a, as, a, as a historical philologist, which is, you know, what Tolkien's primary technical specialty was, right? There's a premise that you can, by way of understanding language change, I mean, it's very evolutionary, it's, I don't say really, I don't think, it, it, Tolkien's not really evolutionary at all, right? He's he's more, um, he appreciates the way art changes, right? It's, it's about mm -hmm. a skill and a and transformation that you can under, if you understand language properly, you can know from the present forms of the words what it would have been. Right. And, and the asterisk forms of the words are the ones there's no written evidence for. We have no historical record of them in our archive, but you can project that there must have been that word used in the past. Right. And and in philological convention, you as Shippy talks about, you sign that with an asterisk. Right. Yeah. So if you look in dic dictionary definitions in the etym etymological histories yes, and you get yeah. to the word, you get to the word with the asterisks. That one is one for which we don't know. Right. We have no actual primary evidence for it in our archive. But following proper philological scientific principles, you can say that word existed. Right. Tolkien's doing that with everything. Right. It, so he's he's taking. Like you, you've looked at Rohan and and the the Anglo Saxons, for example. Or um, I know where Gondolin is is supposed to be from. I mean, it's a, a, a walled city, right? So mountainous. I mean, a lot. Of, uh, there's there's a um, John Garth's book on um, Tolkien's places. Have you read that one? Yep. That's actually lovely, right? Where he's looking, looking like they went on the walking tour in, in, in Switzerland and you can see Rivendell in yeah, 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 yeah. Lauterbrock, right? 
Yeah. So it's it's like he's taking all of the things that we have in our present existence as pointers to the history that they came from. And if you study the if you study our world carefully, like for example, the place name, the the river named Thames, if you understand what Thames means, you find the tame dragon of Farmer Giles, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that it's it's the the clues are there if you know how to read them and to travel back in in time with them, right? So you're saying is is it really history or what is it, right? Well, that's the other thing that once the 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 Notion Club characters have had their conversation about dreams and travel and 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 so forth, and um, Raymer has proved that. Then they get into this um, discussion about. Um, going back in time, right? What mm. what that would mean. And um, Jeremy, that they start talking about um, particularly the, uh, let's see, yeah, this is a good place to go in. Um, the conversation drifted again, so says the text. Starting from the beginnings of language, we began to talk about legends of origins and cultural myths. Guildford and Marcuson began to have an argument about corn gods and the coming of divine kings or heroes over the sea, in spite of various frivolous interjections from Loudham, who seemed curiously averse to the turn of the talk. The sheaf personified, said Guildford, and then there, uh, here, unfortunately, one leaf is missing, right? Um, and the the, the sheaf, um, they, they've, um, I just like, forgot what they're going to talk about. Um, it's the shield sheafing story that's at the beginning of Beowulf, right? And, and Tolkien played with that one a lot, saying, here, here's in Beowulf, which a poem which he had memorized backwards and forwards, right? There's one of these hints that you can project back. There must have been a fuller story, right? His, mm. That's always his feeling. Like there must have been a yeah. fuller story. Um, and you know, he loved the idea that yes, Queen Elizabeth, you know, like the queen at the in the time that he's writing is a queen that's still queen now. So you can play the sort of the historical ripples carry back, right? is related to probably an ancestor of this, you know, it's it, that, that if you follow the threads and it's like, a, it's, it's this journey, um, just like um, Raymer, you know, goes back with that meteorite, right. And follows the threads of the meteor back to the Tekel Miram and mm -hmm. the crystal worlds. You can, as a historian, follow those traces back into, well, where, and that's the Jeremy, as you said, this is like, there's, the fiction is there's a leaf missing. Okay. Yeah. But I don't think one can be so sure. Sometimes I have a queer feeling that if one could go back, one would find not myth dissolving into history, but rather the reverse, real history becoming more mythical, more shapely, simple, discernibly significant, even seen at close quarters, more poetical and less prosaic, if you like. In any case, these ancient accounts, legends, myths about the far past, about the origins of kings, laws, and the fundamental crafts are not all made of the same ingredients. They're not holy inventions. And even what's invented is different from mere fiction. It has more roots. One of them asked, roots in what, said frankly. In being, I think I should say, Jeremy answered, and in human being, and coming down the scale in the springs of history and in the designs of geography, I mean, well, in the pattern of our world as it uniquely is and of the events in it as seen from a distance. So he's, and this is this is the closest that I know that Tolkien got to explicitly theorizing that relationship between myth and history. He, he sort of points mm. to it in in fairy stories and on fairy stories, but here they're, they're sort of, and, and I think he's getting a lot of this from Barfield, right? like poetic diction. Barfield's poetic diction. How, what happens if you can travel back in time? What is it like, right? And and yeah. the characters here are playing with this idea that um, history becomes more mythical the further back you go, and that is mm. a, a linguistic claim that Barfield makes in poetic diction. That the further back you go in time, the more sort of the the concrete, the and the, and the abstract and the symbolic in our languages are all still com combined, right? And the example that Barfield gives is spirit, right? Spiritus, that originally he says, it means both breath and wind and soul all together. And, and we yeah. have, we have a sense that these are just three see, we have different words for them now, but the further you would go back in this imagining, the more mythical reality actually is. Right. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, so, you know, for example, Arthur, King Arthur, and then they go, they go on to start talking about King Arthur some and, and trying to understand, it's like, was King Arthur real? And he's like, well, he's more real than history because in fact, the myth that we find in the, in the, you know, we travel back in time is the reality, is the history. Yes, these are uh, aspects which he basically says, you know, the cauldron of story, and we're talking about the precedents which, you know, uh, precedents which, you know, a historian will assign to certain figures. And then we talk about these ideas of mythical elements edit, um, added to this cauldron of story. But there are certain particular aspects which I want to go into regarding the um, how we construe Lord of the Rings. Obviously, uh, Tolkien famously said he despised allegory. Yet if we're looking at this right. as some sort of um, primordial history, when I was um, uh, discussing this with Nathan Hood, um, I couldn't help but read real history into some of the events. So if I say, take, for example, uh, the history of Gondor, um, there are many sort of allusions, you know, one you've um, drawn to in terms of the, um, the geographical aspect of this is, of course, tying this either to um, Rome or Constantinople. Uh, one thing you can draw with this, you know, is there some possible allusion to the Kingdom of Israel in that? Uh, one particular sort of um, hypothesis I've had is uh, linking this back to two events. Obviously, one is um, the, when we talk about the siege of Minas Tirith, is the, you know, siege of Constantinople in 1453. But you link that even further back. And um, I posit that possibly um, uh, Minas Ithil, uh, turning Minas Morgul, is in many ways could be construed as um, a surrogate for um, uh, for Constantinople. Um, that and the symbolism of this, you know, if we're going to use the the Ottoman advance as some sort of again analogy to the to the advance of Mordor, and say for example we take Osgiliath, which was you know an original capital of um, of Gondor as some sort of Budapest. And then move on to Minas Tirith, and then Minas Tirith becomes not Constantinople, but Minas Tirith becomes Vienna. And when we look at Theodoric the Great, uh, th um, uh, the uh, King Theoden, uh, he is not a, um, a Theodore uh, Theoden king um, from you know the Battle of Chalons in um, 1451, uh, but he becomes Jan Sobieski. Uh, so my question is, um, there's almost you know real history you can read into in terms of the uh, primordial aspect in terms of you mentioned this idea of philological reconstruction. However, mm -hmm. I can't help but also re um, uh, read many different uh, many different eras in the history in Lord of the Rings. So for example, we talk about you know 1453 to 1683. Uh, we're talking about you know early modern history. When I look at um, Rohan, for example, you bring uh, the very you know, conscious example of you know some form of reimagining of the story of um, Beowulf, particularly with um, Medeseld and Edoras. Mm -hmm. uh, there are also you know certain aspects I draw, which uh, you know what essentially how can you um, conceive of of Rohan? I mean, of course, in addition to um, uh, you know, early Germanic languages, Tom Shippey discusses um, uh, Tolkien's uh, fascination with Gothic and East Germanic, and of course, linking this back to etymological roots, um, I believe. Horsa, taking the etymolo etymology of Horsa and linking this back to horse. And so, for example, imagining that this um, primordial sort of ancient kingdom of the mark essentially um, etymologically came from horse and therefore it is a version of England, a version of the kingdom of Mercia, um, envisioned etymologically through the idea of the horse and you know, link this also back to the um, uh, the great plains of what we now call Crimea, uh, where the imagined sort of kingdom of the, the Eastern Goths were. And but then you also draw in I, I draw in other parallels. So for, so for example, the um, the relationship between Constantinople and the Peritea, i.e. the Goths in the Crimea. And what I see is many elements which you can draw. For, so for example, bringing this back to the Kingdom of Mercia, we're talking the Dark Ages. We're talking you know the sixth century to before Athelstan's unification of England in 927. But with the case of Constantinople. We're talking about, you know, again, the early modern period and the very late medieval period. And then, of course, there is the idea of the how how do the hobbits play in this? I mean, to my mind, uh, the conception of the Shire, the Shire is almost timeless in the sense when we're looking at it historically in terms of their language, for example, they speak a form of um, a form of language which is much closer approximation to how people would have spoken in the 20th century compared to say for example the older version of old english spoken by um uh, rohan and so to my mind especially when you sort of see the hobbit as being brought in later there are many aspects to the hobbits in particular which seem rather historically anachronistic so at the same time, you know, we mentioned this idea of this um, 
this elaborate form of time travel. Yet at the same, and again, this idea of philological reconstruction. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm you know, trying to understand this whilst also reading into all of these events, uh, real history, real potential analogies, and really trying to understand how we can situate these places in space and time, if that makes sense. Yes, um, but I, I'd say uh, framing that, why does it matter, right? Mm. It's like, what is, what is your longing? for his story to connect with all of those those other stories can you hear my cat <laughs> she started up <laughs> slightly yes slightly. <laughs> the dog is asleep the cat unfortunately is started on her this is why there's no cats in the stories um that i think i think what what i would want to know is why why does that appeal to you so much right why in your reading the stories is is there that longing to find all of those connections and why that sort of feels so much richer if you feel like that there is that element in in tolkien's crafting of his stories i had a i i did a review this summer for holly ordway's book on tolkien's modern reading have, have you read mm. that one yet uh, no not yet no uh, so and and i i did this kind of I don't know whether the, the the twist was clear in the in the version that I I whatever that I published right, but I had this frustration when I was reading her story her book because she kept she kept ruining everything for me by showing oh no in fact you know that may me you know that magnificent battle that Tolkien describes of I, there's a really great uh, I think it's William Mor from William Morris's if that's the right book it's one that I hadn't read um, descriptions of like the the Goths in Rome or something hmm. like that that and and you can you know go word for word from passages and this is what she does throughout the book you know showing you passages after passage after passage that Tolkien got from actually modern authors that he was reading right and and I think that hmm. the heart most heartbreaking one um was um oh golly in uh Inglesant, right um in, in that one where there's a passage that Ordway says this is probably where Tolkien got the the original inspiration for um, talking about the the feeling of joy, like swords pointing as grief in the response of Sam to the battle of uh, to the um, Cormolan field fields of Cormolan, right when the the bard mm. comes out and starts singing. I'm like, darn it! <laughs> I wanted that to be Tolkien's own invention, and you show me that he's probably reading it somewhere else, right? So. It, 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 and I was interested because, you know, in other contexts, I've been quite happy to find, you know, oh, look, when he's reading Beowulf and he's and certainly the scene in Magiseld is, you know, straight out of the, the, the challenge that the border guard gives to Beowulf yeah, and yeah, yeah. his company and, and so forth. So, you know, I think th there's a, there's a kind of aesthetic and psychological Inter, you know, tr intriguing thing for me was why was I mad after I finished reading her book? <laughs> you know, that she's like basically shown me that Tolkien's completely derivative of people I don't even respect as authors, right? They're ordinary, they're, you know, third rate storytellers. And oh, yeah. I, I, I think just, just to preempt people. the point I'm making, I, 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 do, I do apologize <laughs> profusely if I have aggravated you in my analysis. Um, but um, no, no, no. no. I, I, don't, I don't mean to show. Um, I, I have, no, I have an answer. Analysis. All right. <laughs> but, but, but so what I'm curious, you know, what's curious is like, when does this kind of, an, and, and the thing is I respond that way because my students in my class often worry about that. Right. They, they, they you know, they'll say to me, I mean, they're worried for a lot of reasons because people do a lot of things to modern text right now. Um, but, but I think they're, they are also, you know, worried about what Tolkien points to in the, in the Beowulf lect, the essay where, you know, you have this gorgeous tower from which you can see the sea, which John Garth very nicely shows this was actually probably a real tower in Oxfordshire that people were compl hmm. complaining about. So it's kind of inside joke, but, um, there, there's a tower from which you could see the sea and the, you know, the scholars come in and knock it all down and then worry about what a muddle it's in. Cause it's just rocks. Right. So <laughs> there's, there's. At what point are we delighting in Tolkien's creativity and his ability to give us this feeling of being in this amazingly true story that then has these all of these ripples and resonances into real history, right? And at what point are we frustrated and angry by that exercise? And what's interesting is in, in the Notion Code Papers, they go on to be talking about this sort of relationship between myth and history, and um, they're... they're 
worrying about, you know, d does this going back in time and finding the myth just erase true history? W where is the power in that, right? Yeah. And um, uh, for example, there's there's a sort of, you know, little internal joke here. Hmm, Raymer muttered, considering. Yes and no, he said. Nicholas could, especially into the scenes that he's pictured or repictured fairly solidly and put some mental work into. We could, if we did the same, um, go back in time, right? Or, or the things. People of future, if they only knew the records and studied them and let their imagination work on them till the notion club became a sort of secondary world set in the past, they could, right? It was a joke there. It's hard to pull excerpts from this because it's in a conversation, right? The joke there is, look, you could take the, the our actual minutes and and project them and pretend they're fictional when we know they're real, but it's a fiction, right? So yeah. Tolkien, he's always self-conscious of this problem of inserting yourself into the story. But I think I think what um, Raymer responds in this moment is, in fact, what he's trying to grasp, right? So um, let me set this up. Yes, frankly, said Jeremy, you've got to make a distinction between lies or casual fiction or the mere verbal trick of projecting sentences back by putting the verbs into the past tense, between all that and construction, especially of the major kind that has acquired a secondary life of its own and passes from mind to mind. They're talking about storytelling and the problem of like, how do you create this sense of going back, right? Quite so, said Raymer. I don't think you realize, I don't think any of us realize the force, the daimonic force that the great myths and legends have. From the profundity of the emotions and perceptions that begot them and from the multiplication of them in many minds and each mind mark you an engine of obscured but unmeasured energy they are like an explosive it may slowly yield a steady warmth to living minds but if suddenly detonated it might go off with a crash yes might produce a disturbance in the real primary world they're meditating on the power of stories and and mm. the um in our, our current moment for example, when I was just listening to Mateus Desma talk about mass formation. <laughs> um, and I'll, I've also been meditating a lot on um, uh, electrical, the, the electrical media that, that Tolkien yep. obviously was living in. And we are very much living in now. The power of all of these minds, like resonating together. Tolkien is writing in a period when they're mainly having, they mainly have radio, right? And, and they, they mainly mm. have this power of voice that they can all listen to at the same time. Um, I've also been reading a lot of Marshall McLuhan, and I, I think there, I think there's an explanation for Sauron in here, <laughs> um, which is what we get to in, in not too too long in this. We're going to have Zigger Sauron show up in in this in this conversation. Um, that Tolkien and contemporaries they were very worried about this, you know, force. You see the language that there's daimonic force, um, unmeasured energy. Remember when they yeah. were playing with the science fiction of the time travel and the dream stories, they're also yeah. trying to understand basically electricity, right? This is this is an mm. electrical power of, of charging the whole world with stories and telling saying, I this is new to my argument. This is this is new stuff for you rather than stuff I've used before. The um yeah. trying to understand the way in which all of us can be hearing the same stories at the same time and and they they create this like cataclysmic change in the in the present in the primary world um and to to respond to this Raymer comes up with well i wasn't thinking of any particular legend said Raymer, but well for instance think of the emotional force again this sort of we know what this feels like right now what we've all been living through in the world in the past two years which i think matters a lot because tolkien lived through one of those moments in world war one and then again in world mm -hmm. war two right it's mm -hmm. going back to it's not allegory it's history it's the feeling of what it, it is like to be caught up in one of these moments when the story is so powerful and the story is so real. And that certainly happened in the Great War, right? That they all ended yeah. up in the trenches. It's it, it's happening. It happened again, not the atomic bomb, but the atomic energy, the power of the mind that brought together the cataclysm that we call World War II. And you know, there's been others, obviously, but the last two years, the, the pandemic, I think, is one of the another of these, this, this daimonic force, the immeasurable energy of all of these minds resonating with the same emotional power. Right. OK, but this is the example that Raymer's about to give. Think of the emotional force generated all down the west rim of Europe by the men that came at last to the end and looked on the shoreless sea, unharvested, untraversed 
first unplumbed. And against that background, what a prodigious stature other events would acquire, say, the coming apparently out of that sea, riding a storm of strange men of superior knowledge, steering yet unimagined ships. And if they bore tales of catastrophe far away, battles, burned cities, or the whelming of lands in some tumult of the earth, it shakes me to think of such things in such terms, even now. Now, that is Tolkien by way of Raymer, by way of the fiction that this is an actual conversation, referring to the Numenorean legend, which he's going to yeah. work into the Notion Club papers, but which is also like the background of what's Gondor, right? It's it's the 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 survivor, it's the foundation of the survivors of drowning of Numenor. Mm -hmm. Um and you know that it's another famously that dream, it's just like Tolkien had that dream of the wave, which he puts in these characters' experience. Mm -hmm. He's Tolkien is a powerful storyteller because he's thinking in terms of the psychological, emotional power of stories. He yeah. never says that except through his characters, right? But I think what's going on, it's like this is, Shippy talks about him as a great modern writer, right? The the most modern thing Tolkien does is tap into our psyches. So I'd mm. say that's why you're fascinated by finding all those resonances in this different histories and such. Tolkien is trying to get you to the point of feeling the power of that event mythically and and so i think it works in the reverse right you can feel what the fall of constantinople was like because you've read gondolin yes and i, I think this is the, just to the description of the 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 yeah yeah sorry you're, you're cutting out a tiny bit there but um I, I can luckily follow most of what you're saying but um no other than that i just wanted to emphasize that when i'm focusing on these particular aspects of you know what i read into the the individual cultures or whatever i'm not sort of gaining appreciation or trying to isolate them and say you know oh well tolkien was you know d derivative of that or taking um uh, taking taking inspiration from that or i don't know the the names and the hot end of the dwarves and the hobbit for example i'm not um trying to focus on the minutiae but rather i'm trying to uh, summarize how within Lord of the Rings there is an element of which all of history is contained and not only that but it transcends being historical and it becomes mythical it becomes almost an eternal truth which transcends mere academic history and that is what I find so, you know so absolutely fascinating about this one um, uh, other aspect which I wanted to talk to is where you were talking about you know the point the point of entry in history um, how essentially we can construe this within place and time how this sort of relates to philology. Uh, well, another aspect I want to talk about is the the nature of progress and the nature of time itself. Um, so obviously, Tolkien was a Catholic, and that very much informed his worldview in terms of in terms of history, in terms of progress in history. And you mentioned this idea of um, EU catastrophe. You know, from this great level of despair and hopelessness, we arrive at the situation where there is some triumphant resolution. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, you know, I can't help but read you know, the City of God, um, St. Augustine of, of Hippo's conception of a, a Christian teleology within the within the works of Tolkien and essentially that mm -hmm. this is you know some sort of um uh, continuous fight between uh, the heavenly city and the earthly city between uh, the forces of supreme good god aru Luvatar, and the forces of eternal negation corruption what have you um sauron the you know ever diminishing returns of evil what have you um how much would you say this you know, legitimately informs uh, Tolkien's worldview and you know, how much can this really be gleaned from Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion in general, if at all. How many hours do you want this video to go on? <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother layer, right? <laughs> You're right. Yes, it does. Uh, you asked me to talk about history. Um, so in the, in the wider scope of what I talk about in my, my Tolkien videos on unauthorized.tv, um, I'm, I'm de dealing specifically with that problem of creation and subcreation and fall. And the Silmarillion is the story of multiple falls, right? And mm -hmm. and so, I mean, w w when you're when you're thinking about no, seriously, this is a whole other topic. Right? <laughs> I'm glad it brought. I'm glad I made you think of it. Um, that that you know, Melkor as one of the angels at the the, the singing of the world and you know, it's the singing of creation. Um, th th there's there's whole layers of things about music and harmony and the way in which yeah. his dis his discord becomes incorporated into the story. So that's mm. I, when when I teach that part of it, we actually read selections from the City of God on the angels, 
Mm. And um, to understand that Tolkien, um, one, he understands that the angels were there at creation, which is is kind of part of the apocryphal uh, stories of of Christianity, but the angels, but that's what, you know, everybody knows that the angels are there at creation, except it doesn't say it in the Bible. Hmm. It does say it in th in places like Job where um, the morning stars all sing at, at creation. It's more in the things like the book of Enoch, which I know some people are quite interested in um, because you, or Jubilees, right? There's, there's a description explicitly of day one of creation when the angels are singing the elements into being and there's all these spirits of of the ice and the snow and the, the winds and, and and so forth and the the Einar are are clearly like that right they're elemental angels and so the whole mystery and and this is why it's like i was talking about the subset of where tolkien's imagining in our a capacity to get to the myth behind history but the big field that he's working in and this yes is he wants to understand myth as theologically robust mm. and he's going to take you back in time through all of his legendarium to the origin of time to that moment of creation mm. which then because he's catholic and because for him the gospels are where legend and history has met and fused the, the, mm. the principal mystery of the, the entire thing is the entry of the creator into his creation, which in the the, the, the chronology of the Lord of the Rings and, and all of those stories has not happened yet, right? It's, it's all pre, it's pre-Christian in the sense that it is before the incarnation, but it's all shaped yeah. by that understanding that, that Jesus is Lord of time. Hmm. No, that's 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 so that, that's, that's a whole nother thing to unpack. <laughs> <laughs> but you're you're spot so, on. So yes. <laughs> so um in terms of um so obviously that's one aspect in terms of uh, creation and incarnation, but um another particular aspect I want to focus on is this conception of time, which is of course, you know, and anti the 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 idea that you know history is the next mark of progress, that you know through ten technological innovations you know whatever humanity will rise. But of course, in Tolkien's view, that is completely inverted. Uh, technology is associated with um, a decline, especially this is exhibited in Isengard, but it's explicit in the scouring of the Shire, and of course towards you know re regarding some sort of um. You know, looking at the ages of um of the Silmarillion. So for example, the first age, uh, we have the War of the Wrath, and there is some conclusion there. With the second age, there is the War of the Last Alliance. There is some sort of again EU catastrophe. And then of course the third age, moving on to the fourth age, the destruction of the ring. Um, so what I find fascinating about this this view of history is that there is tangible decline you know looking into the the third age we have the destruct we have the you know the fall of the um the house of anor uh the house of kings gondor is you know replaced and said and rule with the with the house of stewards for so for example uh the kingdom of arnold disintegrates all of these elements implicit elements of the decline you know the, the decline essentially of earthly civilizations yet at the end of these ages there is some form of triumph resolution renewal redemption what have you but again i, I can't help but um uh, consistently read these um uh, catholic themes into Tolkien's work do you think that's fair um, that's fair too um and i think it's it's the it's it's okay so you're talking about time and technological progress of course progress is this enlightenment satanic fantasy mm. precisely <laughs> thank, thank you <laughs> that we can by our machines you know re do better than god right yes. and um that that that's the aspect of the fall that you know tolkien explores in the silmarillion um both in melkor's desire to make something that he thinks iluvatar is neglected right that iluvatar has mm -hmm. neglected the void which doesn't exist until iluvatar actually proposes the themes but mm. that you know more specifically with the characters like Feanor um makes the Silmarils they're the thing that is they're his most precious creation um I, I have lots of meditations on the meaning of those Silmarils and I think they're you know the sort of Catholic imagery behind that is they're the host in a monstrance right they're mm. a, like a, oh, a yeah a crystal they're crystal with a living fire inside yeah um but that the 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 problem the problem is not that we make things right. There's also the very positive element of art throughout the story that you know the yeah. elves make beautiful. Um, they make the alphabet. They make music. They make clothing. They make cities. Um, the Numenorians are not bad, and they want to make make things. It's the the misuse of 
our creativity that is the problem. And you know, interestingly, in the in the poem, the famous poem that Tolkien wrote for Lewis, Mythopoeia, where he's trying to persuade him that myths have truth in them. Hmm. Um, one of the things he points to is, you know, we make, you know, we, we have still our free will used or misused. We make still by the law in which we are made, right? So everything that Tolkien is meditating on is this tension between art in response to the invitation of the creator to participate in his themes and the, the satanic, you know, desire to make in spite of God's theme. Mm -hmm. So it's the problem with modernity is that we, you know, we're supposed to just, you know, bow down to the satanic and, and say, oh yes, save us, which is the problem, right? We're not going to be saved by the satanic machines. We're going to be saved one by the, you know, entry of the Lord into history, but mm -hmm. we are, we are saved by, you know, working within creation, not against it. And mm -hmm. that, you know, so the simplistic sort of enlightenment, yeah, if we are all just rational, we'll, um, you know, make make the world better than God made it. Well, good luck with that. Right? Mm. No, thank you. And that's um, th that's a wonderful elucidation because it more or less goes off with the um, with the theme I was um, discussing on my on my previous stream regarding his political philosophy and that all of these um, these forms, these these iterations coming after Melkor are created in spite or as an antithesis towards the the true organic form of nature or the true working of the world and some again some form of um uh, divine harmony it is always done in spite of that or an attempt to you know overcome that and of course that is you know perfectly exhibited in the the characters of melkor and the characters of um saruman and in uh Kumano in in saruman and of course uh, the fate of all these creatures is again decline in the case of saruman a um almost total oblivion in terms of his um all of his ambitions coming to this you know, very pathetic revenge at the end of the scouring of the shire and you can say an encapsulation of tolkien's own dystopia and all the themes relating again back not only to um uh the idea of um uh, technology and progress being actually inverted in tolkien's my view or, or again progress is that um enlightenment idea but again linking this back to you know his own experiences coming back from the war etc or his own experiences of um urbanization industrialization within the um the west midlands um so in terms of other broad themes because this has been a um a very meta stream and i haven't really wanted to delve into <laughs> into the particulars <laughs> uh, simply because i had you with me and um i really wanted to um uh, to get into um the consensus essentially of what um uh Tolkien's philosophy of history was. Um, is there anything else before I go into the super chats? Any other points you want to bring up? Well, so there's uh, we're still you know, there's still more in the Notion Club papers. So I hope everybody's curious to read read them. I keep you you're talking about Gondor, and I keep mentioning Gondolin, which is which is funny because my last but one episode um, in on Forge of Tolkien was on Gondolin, and I was you know like, surprised mm. at myself that I'd never like paid attention to Gondolin. I'd never. Mm -hmm. Done a lecture on it. I never, there, if if you read the 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 um siege, the description of the siege of Gondolin, mm -hmm. those are those are war machines, right? They're like living. They, they the description of them, they sound like something out of, um, I think it's. I, I'm not. I'm not up on my superhero movies, but the Avengers movie where all the 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 it's like uh segmented monsters come out of the sky. <laughs> <laughs> like tank treads or something, right? So mm. there's, I'm, not, I'm not the person, by the way, I, to ask for them. I, neither <laughs> am I, clearly. But <laughs> but the um, you know, the science fiction element in Tolkien's stories is pretty powerful. And the, but it's that he he both he wants it to be both scientific as with the dreams and to, as you're saying, you know, give us warnings about the misuse of technology. But he's never he's he's not anti-tech, right? Because no. the elves themselves. You know what they 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 deny that they have magic. It it just looks like magic to you know people who don't understand how it works. What they do is mm. craft with love of the materials. So mm. it's it's more the it's not anti tech or pro tech. It's understanding your relationship to your creator and making within yes. within that absolutely. relationship. Yeah, absolutely. So um, anything else? Oh, probably. But why don't you look at the super <laughs> chats? <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, I'm being serious. I mean, the wonderful thing is because this is a um, a belated stream. Um, I don't have you under a um, a very strict. Oh um, well, okay. Uh, timetable. 
it's so so the, the 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 last the last sort of element of the framing that that is helpful to have is um the the, the notion club papers were just one of tolkien's like failed efforts at time travel story the other one the the more specific one is the lost road and it's mm. it's interesting if you take what i've been saying about the dreams and the the philology and the travel and that the lost road was meant to be a story that would go from the present back through pairs of fathers and sons um yeah. in conversation through the anglo-saxon period to the you know the, the lombards the you know the the paul, paul the deacons lombardy back to numenor right and tolkien really only wrote the the two poles of that he wrote the modern period some sketches on the Anglo-Saxon and then and the Numenorean, but but the interesting thing about the whole the whole framing is that the characters alternate in generations. The names Elfwin and Oswin, mm. more specifically Elf friend and God friend, yeah. right? And and that again showing that Tolkien really wanted to link his stories to our present by way of these characters that could carry the stories. And if you're re when you're reading. This is another insight I have from Verlaine Flieger, but it, it enriches your reading of The Lord of the Rings a lot, I think. Notice when the characters are called elf friend. They're mm -hmm. usually the like Sam or Frodo. They're storytellers who invite you into the story. And that that, that cascade of frames, it's, it's always what Tolkien is trying to do mm -hmm. so that we find ourselves inside. And, you know, the great frame that he's working with is that of, of our being made in the image and likeness of God. And, and I think what's curious about, I mean, he's very Catholic. He's theologically Catholic. He's liturgically Catholic. There's all sorts of wonderful stuff about the sacraments and so forth. But he's he's chronologically and historically um, Catholic in the sense of wanting, us, wanting you to realize what story you're in, right, mm -hmm. constantly. And that is, this is my favorite passage that I can almost dupe from memory now, right? When Sam and Frodo are on the stairs of Kirith Ungol and they're talking about finding themselves in the story, Right. They look up and see the star and Sam says, ah, we're in the same tale still. Right. That's Tolkien's fundamental historical claim. We're in the same tale still. And if you know your Augustine, you realize that's the story of the incarnation, redemption and, and salvation. So we're in the same tale still. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and um, I think that's I think that's a, a, a wonderful summary. So I'll just. Um, I just get onto the super chats quickly, but but thank you so much for that. Right. Yes. Okay. Um, a Walrus for fifty krona uh, just says, "Keep it up." Well, well, thank you, A, a, a Walrus. Um, thank you. Uh, Vingle for a another fifty uh, Norwegian krona. Uh, Tolkien stresses in on fairy stories that a tale being a dream story precludes it from being a fairy story. He uses Alice in Wonderland as an example. And, and this is, he, he didn't like it when you broke out of the dream and it was all a fake, right? And mm -hmm. I think that's what, what, what he doesn't like about Alice in Wonderland is it's not clear the relationship between the dream world that she's been in and her real world. Whereas what they're trying to do, I think it's, it's, his, it's his, he's aghast at the clumsiness of the device actually. Mm. Um, and, and with the, the reading that they did of Dunn's experiment in time, they, he wanted the dream practice to actually work, I think, right. Just like his philo philological studies, he wants to actually get back in time by way of finding the root of what it meant, it, 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 it meant that's rhyme or Arundel, right. That mm. he, he doesn't, he doesn't, he, he disliked the fakery of, of devices that, for example, like in Alice in Wonderland. Wonderful. Ivan95 for 20 euros. Uh, thank you for a great series, AM. As a new reader of fiction, I can't wait to dive into Tolkien's work after I finish the Space Trilogy. Uh, can we hope for C.S. Lewis and G.K. Jesterton days at some point? Um, C.S. Lewis, I really, I mean, other than having read C.S. Lewis, I'm really not the one who's qualified to talk about him. But G.K. Chesterton, um, yes, maybe at some point. Uh, John Gordon for ten dollars uh thank you for talking day am i have a newfound appreciation for lord of the rings and talking's work i didn't have before well thank you very much john gordon and if that's the result of um talking day and all the um wonderful contributions across many channels then i think that's um that's mission accomplished um so that's the end of the super chats rachel 
Is there anything you would like to um, uh, tell us about or um, anything you're doing? I mean, regarding links, I've included a link to Unauthorized and your mm -hmm. Forge of Tolkien series. Uh, obviously, you tell us mu as much about that as possible, but in addition, anything else you would like to talk about? Um, well, on on um, Lewis, if you would like a lovely introduction, it, particularly to the space trilogy stories, but also to Narnia, Michael Ward's Planet Narnia is outstanding. And Ward is, um, I, I think he's done another book. I haven't, I haven't followed up on that properly, but he's got a whole website on Planet Narnia, which will give you a, a, a similar kind of framing that Lewis was just as technically um sort of precise in his his mm. imagining as Tolkien is with his space stories, right? So everything that we've been talking about today about, um, you know, Tolkien's real wanting to have precision in his imagining of how we could time travel. Tol uh, Lewis did it with his space travel too. So Planet Narnia. Um, me, okay. So um, in, <laughs> in the Forge of Tolkien series, there are 40 three episodes. Um, the 43rd episode is a special that I did at BasedCon back in September. It was live um, and talking about the ring. But the, the first 42 episodes are my um, introduction to both Tolkien's ideas about creativity and language and storytelling and, and sort of craft behind the stories. And that's like the first 20 episodes. And then the second 20 are uh, a, a deep reading of the Silmarillion for the most part, right? It, meditating on creation and music mm. and there's some occasional episodes that are things like on his thinking about marriage and and a, a special episode when i got my new dog on um puppy uh, dogs in tolkien's story so there's there's a lot more in the in the unauthorized videos to to play off of anything um, on the um on the roverandum yes i talk about roverandum and and why in fact so baron and luthien is basically the great story of a girl and her dog save the world yeah. um, <laughs> because Luthien is helped by, you know, the, the hound of, of Alan or Juan who, who um, carries her and um, rescues her and then battles with the, the, the hound of Morgoth um, and recognizing that dogs and dragons are always there together in talking stories. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, you know, sort of sorry that he never wrote, you know, proper dog stories, but in fact he did. They're, they're, they're like, Farmer Giles, right? There's a Garm mm. and the, the dragon, right? So if you mm. if you find dragons, you find dogs, which is a nice segue to um, my other my other major link. It's like Tolkien invites us to subcreate with him, right? And I, you know, I, this in my my campus class that I've taught since 2005, the um, the students are invited to subcreate with Tolkien within his legendarium, right? And you know, write poems, you write stories, we make music and, and things like that. But I realized in, in this last year or so that I needed to answer my own challenge <laughs> of writing within the medieval mode of subcreation that Tolkien is, I think, trying to invite us to, which is a very Catholic in, in, this, in mm. the sense of both theologically and um, artistically exercise. So the other place I'd like you to visit is dragoncommonroom.com. Um, my poets and I have um, written two poems now, one modeled on Alexander Pope's Dunciad, which is a satire for grown-ups, it's a little dark. Um, but the, the one that just came out at, before Christmas is a poem about the light. And um, some animals go in search of the light and find it in Antarctica. And, and you know, there's a, there's, we're going to have a challenge if you want to, like, compete for a prize of some signed copies. But um, the, the, the problem being, how do we as Christians write the kind of stories that we would like to read more of, as Tolkien and Lewis said they wish they would? And that's been our ambition and, and quest in Dragon Common Room. So please, please visit our, our website. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, just on things for the channel, obviously, um, I'll get back to the main podcast. I'll be talking about the counter-reformation i'll probably push out put out a video on that on thursday i hope about eight o'clock um there will be the first episode of the new talking series on friday uh and then on the following monday i will be back to my usual podcast with um uh with columba and uh potentially we'll see marcus furious pertinax there as well so um uh do check in for that other than that 
please um, like and uh, share this video and leave a comment. Uh, thank you as always to all channel members and um, people who've donated over on Subscribestar. I want to thank you again profusely, Rachel, for um, <laughs> joining uh, for joining <laughs> me today. Uh, it has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, sadly, I'm still getting over a bit of a cold, so um, I've um, not been as talkative as I usually am, unfortunately, but um, <laughs> almost a relief because um, this is almost a first where um, I have um, diligently sort of been uh, listening and taking in all of your wonderful insights <laughs> as opposed to um, <laughs> to barreling out all of these points and um, and stunning my guests into submission. So um, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, one final super chat which has come in by Darth Kilhoon for two dollars. Thank you very much. I finally made it to a stream. Love Talking Day. Well, thank you so much, Darth Kilhoon. And this is the final stream of Talking Day, and I'll I'll add it to the playlist. I'll I'll put it before our um political philosophy stream with um uh, Nathan Herb, Mr. Patriarch, um, Coulomb, and Radical Liberation. Thank you all very much for listening. Thank you to Rachel for being such a wonderful guest, and good night. <laughs>